Okay. Marvelous. Well, friends, I am so glad we are all here, whether it's live tonight or in the future times, enjoying the recording and welcome. I just love if we could all introduce ourselves in the chat, sharing our names, where we're coming, calling in from. I would love to see where you are in this world um, by whatever name we are now using for this place. And also, if you know the indigenous lands who you occupy. Hi, I would love to know that too. Sending love, Petra here from Fruition Seeds. She, her, they pronouns from the Western New York Finger Lakes, the Southern edge of Canandaigua Lake from Haudenosaunee, Seneca, unceded lands, a town we now call Naples. And I'm so grateful to be joining you all. I'd love to thank Stacy so much and all the greater Rochester libraries for hosting this marvelous series. I'm so grateful to join us all every month and thank you for sharing your marvelous Zoom platform with us. And I'm so grateful also to the farm crew. There's 12 of us full time here at Fruition Seeds and I wouldn't be smiling here if it wasn't for every single one of them. So just love to acknowledge that this is all work that we are all doing all together. So thank you to everyone at Fruition and to the, our wide family. And here we are. And also a thank you to our ancestors, both plant and human, who for, you know, 10,000 years and counting have been co-adapting together. And it's just such an extraordinary honor to be a part of this living legacy um, continuing on. And perhaps even we might save some seeds if we don't have all of our crops succumb to diseases and pests. <laughs> so <laughs> let's dive right in to kind of four keys to keep in mind for preventing, right? Because prevention is the best cure, preventing pests and disease organically. And I'd love to just begin with this quote, um, a beautiful, in fact, poem from our dear friend Digger before we dive any deeper. Underground, the garlic seed is multiplying. Yesterday, we planted one and tomorrow there will be many. Abundance in this world is made from not too much for any one of us, but plenty enough for all of us. So in this spirit, let us dive right in. So I'd love to just share with you these keys as a laundry list, as a lovely litany, and then we'll unpack every single one. So first and foremost, we're going to talk fertility. We're going to talk soil health. We're going to talk relationships, number one. Number two, we're going to talk about increasing airflow and reducing <laughs> leaf humidity. So crucial. Number three, we're going to talk tools, really simple tools tricks of the trade, if you will. And number four, as my, as Rumi likes to say, um, love thy enemy, as my mother likes to say, know your enemy. <laughs> and I say, you choose. <laughs> so <laughs> before we dive into those any deeper, let's just run through that laundry list again. Soil health, fertility, increase airflow, he reduce humidity, number two, tools, tricks of the trade, number three, and then know or love thy enemy. So now let's start from the top, soil fertility, health, and like, let's just back up for a moment, 15,000 foot bird's eye view. What are we talking about tonight? We can talk about powdery mildew, and we will. And we can talk about Japanese beetles, and we will. What I really want to be focusing tonight is on plant health, which is actually soil health. If it wasn't for the soil, there would be no plants to begin with. There wouldn't be, and there would be all kinds of diseases and all kinds of plants. Let's talk. This is not about deterring insects. This isn't about eradicating disease. It's about promoting such robust, incredible health in our gardens that the, prevented, the prevention is so rich and comprehensive that we barely even need to talk about the cure. 
which we need to do both. We need to have insurance policies and we need to just take care of ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. They're both crucial. But what I really wanna focus on is these preventative measures that so often across the board are going to be nourishing your soil and boosting the immune systems of our plants. And just the same as we, as you and I have immune systems, plants do as well. And just like the wildebeest, <laughs> the cheetahs going after the wildebeest are kind of going after not the healthiest ones, they're going after the sickest ones, right? And the same is true with diseases and pests in our gardens. We haven't yet seen the first cucumber beetle, but it's early June. We're ab I'm waiting any day with bated breath. The cucumber beetles are about to emerge and alight on our farm. And I'm 100% confident they're going, we're going to see them on the most sick, the most stressed, the least like robust, the most nutrient needing plants, the plants that are the most stressed are the ones where those cucumber beetles are going to land on first. And so, so much, we can talk about so many things, but just keep in mind that this is ultimately in the service of plant health. And if we're asking any other question, we're probably going to get the wrong answer. As a final note from this 15,000 foot bird's eye view of what is disease and what are beneficial insects, what are pest insects, how can we prevent diseases and pest insects? My dear friend, Klaus Martens of Lakeview Organic Grain, he asks this. If we ask the wrong question, we get the wrong answer. And his classic question is this. If you ask, how do I get rid of all of these weeds? You get a certain kind of answer, a watershed of responses, of thinking. If you ask, how did so many weeds end up in this garden to begin with, <laughs> right? You get an entirely different line of thinking, a ballpark of responsive thought. And so they're subtly similar. How do we get rid of these weeds? And where did all of these weeds come from? <laughs> but depending which you're asking and how you're approaching the response, you end up with two totally fundamentally different trains of thought. So yes, this is the caveat. We will talk about <laughs> lay blight, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly we're going to be focusing tonight on plant health, on the overarching ways that you can promote extraordinary plant health. And these are the ways that we can, you know, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. <laughs> so here are pounds of prevention <laughs> so that we can possibly talk about cure when we have to but let's dive in. So soil health is, is plant health and fertility makes all the difference. And fertility is really just relationships. Nutrient cycling is not just this like kind of chemical equation. It's this geo <laughs> biological, it's this also chemical, but it's this complex equation of life. Imagine a jungle teeming in the Amazon. This is your garden soil, but on the micro scale, <laughs> it's so extraordinary what happens in the soil. And so feeding those nutrient cycling relationships, feeding all of that micro flora and fauna to be sure that they're all healthy and happy and talking to each other. This is one of the most key things things you can do because again plants have immune systems just like you and I and so the more that you can offer an incredible slew think like not just NPK nitrogen phosphorus potassium but think all the micronutrients think of your key relationships in your life but those are so central but all of the peripheral relationships that make your life so rich and worth living so this is soil and this is what resilience looks like so whether 
whether it's drought, whether it's pests, whether it's disease, too hot, too cold, the, the, your plants have immune systems just like we do that are helping them constantly adapt. So keep in mind that one of the tenets of organic agriculture and just renewable, regenerative, fill in the blank, whatever word is about to be co-opted next, if we're talking about how we can grow gardens beautifully for centuries, for millennia to come, it's about feeding the soil, not the crop, right? Feed the soil and not the crop. So compost is so crucial. Compost, deciduous leaves, whether it's worm castings, there's lots of ways, but those are the three key ones, especially here in the Northeast, that are just, have been building our soils for the last 15,000 years. Can we talk really quick? There used to be 15,000 <laughs> 15, years ago, there was a mile of ice above me. <laughs> and now there's some of the richest soils on the planet beneath me. And that happened because deciduous leaves fall every fall and are continually bringing up nutrients from the subsoil, from the roots of those deep, deep roots of those trees and falling again to the tops of the surface. And then whether it's earthworms, whether it's fungus, just all kinds of teeming microbiomes, just turning that soil over. So yes, compost is amazing and organic matter, is so crucial. Deciduous leaves, anytime you can be adding those to your soil, especially through a chipper shredder first, is the way to incorporate so many so quickly and have it not really become this like jumbled mat on your garden, whether you're tilling or whether you're not tilling. And I love you either way. And yeah, there's so many facets there that think about the big picture of just building your soil health from the bottom up. And friends, if you haven't tested your soil yet this season, go ahead and do it. Check out Fruition's blog on soil testing made simple because soil testing, if you don't really know what is in your soil, how can you amend it? And yes, compost, deciduous leaves, worm castings, they're never bad. But if you don't know the soil you're working with to begin with, it's really hard to make those shifts and amend just so, and your plants are probably going to be pretty stressed as a result. So yes, soil testing is so crucial. There's so much more to share there, but once you have that baseline soil test, from there, you can really start to see the forest from the trees, if you will. And there's always, in terms of plant health, snacks. So I think of snacks as like, fish emulsion as foliar feeding with compost tea as those quick things that you can do as little snacks little bites to help your plants increase their joy and their health and all of their nutrition short term and long term throughout the season so snacks are crucial i call them snacks because i love to imagine this as like if i'm about to climb a mountain i'm gonna bring some snacks i might even bring a sandwich i might even bring two if it's a serious enough mountain <laughs> And your plants are climbing some serious mountains, friends. So never doubt that you need to be offering them lots of snacks. And right, it's like that nothing, snacks are not going to be replacing solid soil health, fertility, three square meals a day. It's going to be hard to replace that with incessant snacking, especially if it's the same kinds of snacks. Almonds are great, but if it's always almonds, <laughs> fish emulsion is great, but it's, if it's always fish emulsion, it's never going to think of those as supplements, as snacks, augmenting the health of your garden and like taking it to the next level. There's a reason we have the icing on the cake, right? Don't forget the icing on your cakes. <laughs> but also don't think that, I mean, I could eat just frosting by myself, who am I kidding? But the cake, you know, don't forget about the cake. So bring the, on the icing, have those snacks, have the fish emulsion, have the compost tea, but don't let that, don't let that distract us from the real meat of it, from the real cake of it, from the real, fact of building long-term health of our soils, feeding our soil and not just the crop. So yes, there's so much to be shared there and so much more to dive into, but just, yes, I just 
cannot underscore enough. The health of your soil are the health of your plants. And if there's nothing else that you take away from tonight, that's number one. Soil health is plant health. And it's all just a series of relationships, a beautiful matrix of life. So now let's dive into, oh, and I forgot to mention, I'm just going to go through my laundry list, unpacking them, and then we're going to have a great big Q&A at the end. So feel free to ask questions in the chat anytime. And if they are clarifying questions, um, Stacy you got this, cut me off in mid-sentence. And if there are like bigger questions, let's, we'll have a great big, beautiful parking lot to just parade around at the end. Um, so maybe Stacy, have I already missed some, some um, clarifying questions? So Chris has um, some sort of bug on her potato and tomato plants. However, I don't know how I can share the picture with you. In oh, you know, and that's a perfect thing for the Q&A. Right. A clarifying question is like, what is nutrient cycling again? <laughs> um, but if it's a specific, more prescriptive question um, about a specific crop and a specific plant disease, a specific insect, let's keep that for the Q&A because it'll be easy to fall down all of those rabbit holes. <laughs> okay. Um, I think... I think that all the questions maybe are best for the end. Cool, awesome. Well, I'll try to keep, move quickly through this so we can have plenty of time at the end, friends. And thank you, Stacy, and thank you all. And yeah, number two is increase airflow paired with reduced humidity. And I paired those together because they're essentially two sides of the same coin. Water is the primary vector for every disease on the planet. And so that's why increasing airflow helps wick humidity away and anything else that you can do to reduce humidity makes such a big difference. So here are some keys, spacing. If you have plants too close together, their leaves are going to be overlapping. There's no other way around it. And overlapping leaves means more humidity. So making sure there's ample space between plants is a great way to increase airflow to reduce humidity. And also that way they're not competing for sun above the ground and nutrients below the ground. So they're going to be intrinsically healthier, happier as well, which means they'll have more robust immune systems and thus be more resilient. Um, so yes, plant spacing, honoring plant spacing, so key on the backs of all of our packets has that info and also on our website has that info too. And when in doubt, give them a little more space rather than a little less. And trellising, also crucial for crops like tomatoes that are super susceptible to diseases. Trellising makes a huge difference in helping them. You know, there's so many benefits of trellising, but here in the context of this conversation, it really increases airflow and reduces humidity. You also wanna keep weeds at bay, right? If there's weeds, there's more things, whether it's to, not just plants, plant matter that reduces the airflow and increases plant humidity. And they're also, you know, just going to be competing for light above the ground and nutrients below the ground. So honestly, anything that you can do to keep weeds at bay, whether it's just weeding um, and having open ground or ideally mulch or other kinds of things to like hold the soil and prevent any other weed seeds from sprouting is the dream. And also with tomatoes specifically, trim the bottom leaves, but you can also do this with lettuce. That's where the lettuce is going to, where diseases are going to be inoculated from is like in between, imagine I'm a great big lettuce. <laughs> it's not hard to imagine. <laughs> if my arms are the lowermost leaves and here's the ground, right? That's like, there's no sun, there's no airflow, there's 100% humidity. And so that's the perfect breeding ground for every disease. Um, so yes, the more you can just be eating those lower leaves to keep them off the ground in the case of lettuce and in the case of tomatoes, and they are so susceptible to diseases. So trimming those bottom leaves, especially if you start to turn, see them turning yellow, which often isn't a big deal. If it's yellow with brown spots, that's most likely a disease. But if it's just yellow, those are, that's likely literally kind of 
robbing mm-hmm. Peter to pay Paul. Plants will often take nutrients from lower leaves that aren't photosynthesizing as readily because they're under the canopy of the uppermost leaves. They'll literally take nutrients from those lower leaves and send them up into the newest growth. Isn't that amazing? Plants are amazing. So yes, trimming off those lower leaves is a great way to just help them <laughs> cut their losses and not inoculate any further disease. Um, so other things to keep in mind with reducing humidity specifically, water in the morning, friends. The earlier, the better. And only water the soil. Don't water the leaves, don't water the stems, especially here in the Northeast, or if you have rain that falls on (laughs) your garden, you've got lots of humidity. And remember, holy moly, water is the primary vector of every disease on the planet. So everything that you can do to reduce humidity and increase airflow is going to make a huge difference. So like watering in the morning using drip irrigation rather than soaker hoses that spray every which way makes a huge difference so yes water the soil not the leaves not the stem and that will go so far in reducing your susceptibility to disease and also decreasing the stress of the plant and thus making them less delicious to those marauding not so beneficial insects as well So another just generalization, if it's raining, stay out of your garden. If it's just after the rain, your garden is soaking wet, also stay out of the garden. That is the time when those spores, especially of any potential diseases, whether they're bacterial diseases or fungal diseases, that's when they're spread most readily in when your garden is just honestly sopping wet. Um, So there's a few keys to keep in mind with our key number two, increasing airflow and reducing humidity. So number three, let's talk about some tools, some tricks for the trade. Um, Oh, this is important for especially cucumbers. (laughs) I mean, that was cute. Especially insects. Think like pest insects rather than diseases. (laughs) Cucumbers are my favorite pest insect. It's true. (laughs) I'll take them all out of your garden and eat them all promptly. (laughs) So let's talk about hoops and floating row cover. So organics, let's back it up actually, because in organics, so much is asking about, and we'll get to this with the no slash love thy enemy. So much is knowing about the life cycle of both the disease and the insect that you're hoping to thwart. And particularly in organics, just simply excluding those not so beneficial insects is the key to just mm, preventing them from annihilating your crops and tempting you from spraying things. We live in such a culture right now of silver bullets of how can I spray something? What pill can I pop to just relieve this incredible (laughs) discomfort? And it's just asking the wrong question. And remember, if you ask the wrong question, you'll get the wrong answer. Knowing that there's no such thing as a silly answer or a wrong or, or a silly question or a wrong question, you can just always often ask better, more specific questions. And so, yes, this like, trick of completely excluding insects, if you can at all, is so much where it's at in terms of prevention being a pound of cure. So hoops and floating row cover. Hoops, you could be put floating row cover, which is just spun polyester. And we share some on our website. And it's very thin, it lets the sunlight through, it lets the rain through, but it's going to, as long as there are no holes, exclude insects like flea beetles, exclude insects like cabbage loopers and cabbage moths, cabbage worms. It's going to exclude cucumber beetles. So the key and over hoops, which can honestly be anything. We have these awesome spring steel hoops on our website that are just 
you can bend them a thousand times and they won't break. They're in, an incredible alloy, super lightweight. We've had them for years, bend them in all the configurations. We're still using them. You can also um, duct tape them together and have an even bigger hoop. And so that way you can actually, it's really important, whatever, if you use one of our hoops or any other kind of structure, you just wanna make sure that there's plenty of room for especially your cucumbers, for your zucchini, for your large broccoli, for your large plants to not be encumbered by that floating row cover. So having it over hoops or any other kind of structure is crucial. And then making sure that all of the periphery of that floating row cover is totally <laughs> solidly like down and like not going to have a little hole that your insects can crawl in because if they can, they will. They're incredibly motivated to go eat the cucumber taste in, in your cucumbers. Um, so they will find a way if there's a way. So just be sure that there's no holes in your floating row cover and that you're absolutely like solidifying all the edges of your floating row cover. And quick note here, when it comes to say cucumbers, specifically watermelon, winter squash, summer squash, you can have them, we have them as soon as we plant them, we have them covered hoops and row cover and we're completely excluding them until the moment of cucumber beetles, until that moment that they're flowering. And as soon as they flower, we need insects to actually pollinate them. So yes, once they flower, then we bring, take off the hoops, take off the row cover, and it's a free for all. And the cucumber needles are suddenly just in there going to town. And it's not a big deal. If your plant, if your summer squash has never experienced a cucumber beetle before the fact that before the moment it's flowering, it is just already so healthy, so happy, so robust that it's not going to be daunted. And so yeah, if you can get your plants to the extent that they are that healthy and happy um, and at that level of maturity before they have to, oh my gosh, get in there and <laughs> contend with pest insects, you're just, you're already ahead of the curve and it's gonna take a lot. Um, there you're going to have plenty of abundance to harvest so also you can make things like you know if plants would rather not get um rained on and other things so i just want to lift this up too because high tunnels and greenhouses are expensive but if you can get those cattle panels those hog panels and put plastic covering over them and add even one is great but two or even three you can make your own little greenhouse super inexpensively that way and the hotter and drier um, of your cucumbers, your tomatoes, the, the, the least, the more healthy they're going to be. So especially in the case of, cu pardon me, cucumbers want plenty of moisture, but in the case of those tomatoes, if you, you even don't have to water them often, once they're established, they will not put on as much foliage if they're not watered as often. And that just means they're going to be that much more. <laughs> <laughs> right? Less susceptible to disease. So, oh, there's so much more to share. There's also disease resistant varieties being an awesome trick of the trade. But I do want to lift up that even if you have amazingly disease resistant varieties, which fruition has many, you're still, if you don't have good spacing, if you're watering at night <laughs> all over the leaves, if you don't have good cultural practices, your plants are still going to succumb to diseases. So, and maybe even the disease that they're technically resistant against if they're that stressed. So just keep in mind that yes, 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 disease resistance in varieties is awesome, but don't let that make you think that you can't do all of these other things. And there's also companion planting, which is another amazing trick of the trade. And I will send you straight over to the webinar that's on our website um, that is in our archives there that's all dialing in, um, in companion planting because there's so much more to share in that regard as well. And now this final, this final piece that I'd love to lift up before our Q&A is this tenet of love thy enemy, know thy enemy. And I just like to acknowledge that I love Rumi, the <laughs> virgin poet, and he says love thy enemy. And my mother says know thy enemy. 
<laughs> and I say you choose. So what I mean by this is it's so important to know all about what you're hoping to thwart if you're actually hoping to thwart it effectively. And we can use this in all kinds of ways. <laughs> we can use it in our gardens when it comes to cucumber beetles. We can use it in our gardens when it comes to powdery mildew. I endeavor to engage these things when it comes to white supremacy. So there's lots of ways <laughs> that we need to be engaging this wisdom of actually knowing something really well and then finding the chink in its armor, right? So David and Goliath, I love this. Have you heard of David and Goliath? Goliath, the Malcolm Gladwell retelling of this, his book is astonishing. I mean, most of his books are amazing. He also has a brilliant 17 minute TED talk on like the synopsis of his book, David and Goliath. It's awesome because we all know the story very differently than the historical context of it. I thought, you know, as a brief aside that, you know, yay, the underdog is winning. That's unlikely and amazing. But the real history of David and Goliath is that Goliath didn't have a chance. And it was just as our society was industrializing that you know, the powers that be were like, whoa, this is a really like dangerous story for those of us who want to concentrate power and wealth. <laughs> so let's kind of try to tell a different story. They effectively did this among many other stories that they effectively sold us. But the thing is, David was going to win <laughs> the way that in the rock, paper, scissors of that moment, watch the Ted talk. It's breathtaking. So the moral of the story with Malcolm Gladwell's timely retelling, reframing of David and Goliath is that Goliath didn't have a chance. And that is true in our gardens as well. So it's all about knowing your enemy, loving your enemy, knowing what does that mean? The actual biology, the actual nitty gritty life cycle, whether it's a bacterial disease, a fungal disease, whether it's a little cabbage worm, <laughs> one, an aphid, get to know that creature's biology, the ins and outs of its life cycle. When do they emerge? When it's flea beetles, you know, you know that it's going to be in spring. When they're cucumber beetles, you know they're going to fly up from the south in early June. When it's a late July, you know late light is going to be wafting in on the breeze along with powdery mildew. So yes, you want to like get to know when the life cycle of all of these diseases, all of these insects, so that you can just really know what to expect and figure out the weak link in its armor. And the good news is you've got us on your team, us being fruition seeds. Hi, I'm Petra. I would like to help you. We are learning constantly and never doubt this is a 14,000 way street. Like we do this together. <laughs> and so we have learned so much from our, our amazing community. So please don't hold back with all the amazing things that you have been learning friends too. And so we, well, we have lots of blogs and we're about to, hopefully in a few weeks have a new website so you can our website will be a way better resource than it is now so you can just effortlessly search petra let's talk about leaf miners and insects and diseases and they'll all be beautifully organized for you so stay tuned but in the meantime we have lots of blogs and lots of on social media I'm always talking about you know these insects these diseases their life cycles and what are those weakest links so just as a generalization if you want to get to don't think okay i've got aphids what can i spray think okay i've got aphids how did they get here what is their life cycle what is that weak link so that I can be dialing in that weak link because that is what is going to, you know, otherwise there you're going to be getting really expensive and really toxic chemicals really fast. Welcome to agriculture 2021. <laughs> so yeah, and scouting, I just would also love to lift up Scouting is so crucial. Scouting is like going out and looking actively, proactively, looking for the leaves that don't quite look normal. Looking for the insects that honestly, so there's 
so many beneficial insects. So getting to know the insects that are you want to have in your garden, that you don't want to have in your garden. So just get to know all the beautiful details of their wings, of their exoskeletons. Honestly, I'd like to just interrupt myself briefly to share this thing that's blowing my mind. Yesterday, I was uh, just sitting in the peppers and, a, and I saw a little ladybug larva that kind of looks like this tiny baby Gila monster. And right, the larval stage of the ladybug looks totally different than the adult stage of the ladybug. And so I saw one and I just like, kind of coaxed it up on my finger and was watching it crawl around my finger for a while. And I noticed something, I've been doing this my whole life and I'm not that old, but for like solidly 30 plus years, I've been letting little die watching ladybug larva on my fingers, watching them move. And yesterday I saw something that I'd never seen before. I noticed that, you know, they have their six legs, but then, and they have their abdomen and on the end of their abdomen, they have this little like sucker. They have this little like suction cup, this little like additional foot that allows them to like, they can not have that attached to anything also. But I would notice that as I was like kind of playing with it, it would attach its abdomen to my finger and then like backtrack, like move back on its abdomen and then lift off and move all of its six legs in tandem to move away from my finger. What? Ladybugs have seven legs, y'all. <laughs> like, anyway, pay attention to all of diseases, all of the insects, and don't assume that you know everything. <laughs> assume that you only know the tiniest tip of the iceberg and that we have everything let, yet to learn and that the more we share with each other, the more we will collectively learn. So yes, I would love to just... Um, final, I'll just leave you with this final thought before we have a delicious Q&A together, friends. So um, don't be shy. Send us emails, specifically send us um, emails at heather at fruitionseeds.com or support at fruitionseeds.com. Heather is our brilliant community care coordinator and she it's her entire job to <laughs> just answer questions and be present with you. So email her and we will would love to be in touch with you. Um, and also we are making an ID library so whether it's insects, whether it's diseases, we're about to be creating this whole library on our website so that you can come to our website and as an amazing resource. Um, so feel we will be uploading all of our pictures, but we'll also, if you're open to us sharing your photographs and experiences, we'd love to share yours as well so that we can truly be for us, by us, this community doing this thing of growing ourselves and growing each other um, together. So yes, please don't be shy and reach out anytime to fruition and check in with Cornell Cooperative Extension. Honestly, I mean, I don't want to be like, come to me we know it all and we can help <laughs> the internet is totally here to help there is so much amazing information out there there's also a lot of terrible information on the internet as well so <laughs> we love to you know just we, between fruition and cooperative extension those are kind of the two sources that we often are like yes we are most confident in those but please don't don't trust me <laughs> I mean, trust me to tell you <laughs> to not just talk to me. <laughs> and so, yeah, without further ado, um, I'd love to dive into the chat and have a little Q&A. All right. So um, Chris has a question about this bug that she found on her potato and tomato plants. And I'm going to see if I can share the screen so everyone can see this picture. Let's see if this works. I'm gonna be here, I think. And is it working? Yes, totally, picture? totally. Do you have any idea what that might be? It's oh. taped because it it flies, so they taped it to. Um, On the screen share, I see just a Google search. I don't see a picture. Oh, you don't see the picture. Okay, so. But you're sharing your screen is the good news. 
<laughs> that is the good news. I'm not sure how to do this. Oh. Well, is there, is there a Zoom? Are you on the Zoom link itself? Um, well, she put it in the chat. You can download it. It, um, and you can look at it, but you have to minimize Zoom and then it'll be like underneath. Mm. I was hoping it would share. Well, maybe I'm tempted to, I'm tempted to stick to questions that aren't picture-based. Um, yes. It's not easy apparently, sadly. But yes, send those, send those. If you want to share pictures, share them with Heather at fruitionseeds.com. Yeah, maybe this can be part of that library you were talking about. Totally. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. Okay. Yeah. Um, aphids, do they live in the soil? Aphids? Not really. They live above the soil. So another way to continue, it's like advantages are not always advantages and disadvantages are not always disadvantages, which is actually a phrase that I learned from Malcolm Gladwell and David and Goliath. And so mulched is such an advantage, right? I mean, how, what's not to love suppressing weeds and retaining moisture, but advantages are not always advantages. So the disadvantage of mulch, and especially, you know, it's nice to like clear out your garden in the fall. So there's nothing in, in your garden, no habitat for pest insects to hang out on. But the, the benefit, the, the disadvantage of having that mulch is that your aphids, flea beetles, squash vine borers are going to be like, yes, this is where I want to hang out all winter. So that is a really key, um, that's a key thing. But yeah, with aphids, yeah, check out our blog about aphids. There is so much more to share. And yeah, that's where a huge amount is just the key with aphids is plant spacing. If plants are spaced well enough, and there and have more airflow and less leaf humidity there's going to be less aphids and then you just want diversity in your garden right so like the more ladybugs there are ladybugs just want to eat your aphids also ants are going to not they are not going to help your aphid populations thrive <laughs> so ants in your garden for the most part are actually a great sign um so yeah, so, you a lot. Yeah. Just chiming in on that, what plants do you recommend to bring more ladybugs into your garden? Mm, yeah, so lots and lots of flowers and also herbs like dill, parsley, those kinds of very like aromatic herbs are really helpful. But honestly, you kind of can't go wrong. You can, but as long as you're planting lots of flowers and just a really beautiful diversity in your garden there's going to be some really and you can certainly purchase ladybugs as well they can actually be shipped through the mail which is amazing um, but generally unless you live in a in an area where you just know you don't see a lot of insects in general is um yeah you're probably going to have plenty of of ladybugs <laughs> um so is to tomato trellising preferred over using cages Oh, yes, totally. So I actually don't like cages at all. They're really simple, but they don't really address the core needs of the plant. And so the only time that I do semi recommend tomato cages is with dwarf compact tomato plants because they don't need, they don't, aren't going to have a ton of weight. They don't need a ton of structure and they're not going to get that big. Otherwise, I love the Florida weave. Check out our blog about that too. Florida weave and just trellising them makes such a big difference because they will actually, you'll, you'll able to have like a much more airflow and much less leaf humidity when you're more, kind of, it takes more work to trellis tomatoes in that way but you can actually trellis them more easily. And then you can be pruning back those bonus branches more easily because especially with those with big full-size slicers, it's so crucial that they have lots of light infiltrating the canopy. Um, quick fun facts, tomatoes are green before they're red. I know you knew that, but that also means that they're photosynthesizing and 80% of the sugars that are in a tomato are generated 
in situ, like in the tomato, right? So they, the more sunlight they get, the sweeter they're going to be, the faster they'll, 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 they'll ripen. So yes, having lots of light infiltrating the canopy is good for lots of different reasons. And it's just hard to trellis a there tends to be a lot of foliage at the top of tomato cages, as opposed to trellising them. Otherwise, you can get more light. Question about um, kelp tea. Um, this person thinks you've recommended using it before fish kelp tea on on leaves. Is wetting the leaves with the teas bad? Ooh, awesome question. So yes, here I am like, Reduce leaf humidity, reduce leaf humidity, <laughs> spray fish emulsion, spray fish emulsion. <laughs> okay, here is the best, here's the intersection. You want to spray fish and kelp emulsion. Fish emulsion is a little higher in nitrogen. I love the balance, more balanced fertility and the increased nutrition, the like 100 plus micronutrients of fish and kelp. You want to spray that in the morning as early as possible. It's like if you're going to water, water in the morning as early as possible. And that way, ideally before nine o'clock, 10 o'clock is like the maximum and the height of summer. 10 o'clock is really late. So as early in the morning as you can spray on, and it's just a film, a thin layer of moisture. And it's, and it's all on the upper portion of the leaves rather than the bottom. And then it, by the time it's the sun is rising, that water is just evaporating, leaving all of those nutrients there on the leaf surface. So yes, that is, um, it's counterintuitive, but yeah, with the, with watering, great big, like lots of water, you only want to be watering in the morning and not on the leaves, right on the soil is key. But with fish emulsion, it's just a light spray that will quickly evaporate. Um, and you don't want to do it too much later than nine, 10 o'clock because otherwise, right, those moisture droplets, those water droplets will refract the sun and can actually, you know, sunburn your plants really significantly. Like, thanks so much for that question. Um, pill bugs, they're all over and have been eating my shallots and radishes. Do you have any suggestions? Ooh, yes. So the good news is you have lots of organic matter. The bad and the bad news is you have lots of organic matter. Pill bugs, little mealy bugs, they have lots of different names, sow bugs too. Um, they just love, love, love. They're there because there's so much extra um, labile fertility. So lay, lots of extra just organic matter that they can be eating. Um, so they are. So in effect, they're doing a really nice thing by reducing your organic matter really quickly. Um, but that's why they're there. So again, like asking the wrong question, getting the wrong answer. If you ask like how to get rid of the pill bugs, that's going to lead to more like eradication chemical answers as opposed to why are there pill bugs? And it's just that like you probably, I don't, you've likely you've added a lot of extra compost and it's more compost than the soil can actually fully incorporate at once and aggregate into its soil um, system. So then you have all of these, that's where the pill bugs are coming in and just like eating it up and helping balance it effectively, um, which can, which is really frustrating. Um, but one of the better things that you can do is to like put, um, just to trap them, like get a little yogurt cup or a little like little plastic container of some kind, and then like put some tasty treats, um, like put a radish like in the peanut butter jam in the bottom of it, and then just keep that at the soil surface, at the top of it in the soil surface, and then dig a little hole so it's down, and they'll fall into it, not be able to get back out. And then from there, you can just bring them to your chickens, to your neighbor's chickens, bring them or just drown them as a other slightly more humane way to kill them. Um, but that's a, another, that's a, a way to just right now in the moment, begin to decrease their populations. But know that it's ultimately a great sign. You have lots of organic matter in your garden and that's great. <laughs> um, how do you eliminate the zucchini borer? 
Oh my gosh. Here's go straight to our blog. Um, <laughs> we have a whole blog about this. This is, could be another hour long webinar, um, which is so much fun. I, we should, because there's so much to share. Um, but yeah, in lieu, just, yeah, I'll send you straight to that blog. If you, even though it's hard to find on our website and you can just because it's not, oh, don't get me started. I can't wait for our new website to be up. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if you email Heather, Heather at fruitionseeds.com, she'll send you the link. And also if you just Google fruition seeds, squash vine borer blog, it'll likely be the number one in your search. So um, yeah, there's so much to share and they're very easy to thwart, but the sacrifice you will need to make is great. Um, <laughs> that was a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> um, what positives can we learn from brood X cicadas? Oh my cicadas. gosh, yes. Oh gosh, that they're this the most beautiful creatures. <laughs> I just am so <laughs> and that there's no one way to survive on this planet, that we all have our unique ways of being in the world and advantages are not always advantages disadvantages are not always disadvantages um and yeah i'm guessing i'm guessing you don't like the cicadas <laughs> in your garden and but um and i totally understand but um yes there are finding the ways to be grateful for everything and see the beauty in everything is another one of the gifts of brood X. <laughs> How many generations of cucumber beetles are born using a grow using a single growing season? So if I pick off the eggs early in the season, will that stop them? Yes. So I forget, honestly, I mean, it depends where you are too. If you're in Florida versus New York, there's a lot more in Florida than there is in New York. In New York, we can have three, sometimes four. I forget which one is more prevalent, which is all to say, get on top of it because <laughs> if there's some at the beginning, there's gonna be a lot more really soon. Mm -hmm. So yes, if you, the best way, if you can stick out for those eggs on the underside of the leaves and just anytime you see an adult, just kill them, kill them, kill them, squish them, squish them, squish them. Um, but yeah, kill it, whether in Colorado potato beetles, scouting for the leaf, the, for the eggs of leaf miners, scouting for the eggs of, Oh my gosh, I mean, so many insects of cabbage worms. That's the least disgusting stage <laughs> to be killing them in. So anytime, and it requires a lot more lifting under leaves. Uh, but yes, I, I look so forward. It's so fun once you get to know like what all of these and what cucumber beetle the eggs look like compared to squash borer eggs. It's just so much fun to you start to see your garden in a totally different way, thinking like an insect. Um, this is just cute. Sheila wants you to know that she's going to be displaying I spy good bug, bad bug in our gardens on her board at her library. And she wants yeah. to thank you for sharing your knowledge for free. <laughs> <laughs> my huge pleasure it's been all of this information has just been shared with me across the years by countless people in countless ways so i feel it's quite a responsibility and a joyful obligation to just be sharing it widely as well and yeah i love that i spy i'm sorry yeah it's super cute <laughs> stacy wants to know she has brown spots on her tomatoes bottom leaves and on her rose Rose's bottom leaves, how can she possibly resolve? Any ideas? Yeah, without seeing a picture, it's really hard to diagnose. And, you know, brown spots may or may not be, sometimes it's nutritional, sometimes it's a disease, sometimes it's the like symptom, the effect of an insect nibbling. So I'd just like to lift up to like, you know, blossom end rot on tomatoes and peppers. It's not a disease, it's a nutrient deficiency. And so it's really, it's a lot of browns and some, and purples, especially, especially this early in the season tend to be more nutritional than disease. And that's 
like there's no generalization I can share. There is just send us pictures. It's case by case and a picture is a thousand words. Lois has a great question because it kind of illustrates what you were saying earlier, um, asking why things are the way they are. So she has so many ants in her garden. What attracted them to the garden? Um, they are eating all my little seedlings. What can I do? Ah, ants are right there with your pill bugs, sow bugs. They are like, oh, good. You've got lots of organic matter. I can farm this. Ants literally farm. They have all of their lovely tunnels under the ground and they literally line certain portions of their home of their ant hill with certain with organic matter that you have access of and they inoculate that organic matter with fungi that's very delicious for them and they're literally growing beneficial to your garden fungi in these channels in their tunnels by kind of accumulating like, like taking your with the soils excess organic matter and lining their tunnel with it so yeah again you have just that much organic matter in your garden <laughs> so and I but it's rare and it's oh that's so heartbreaking it's very rare that ants get to the point where there's so many ants and it can be specific species of ants too that are actually a detriment to your garden most of the time it's no big deal but this sounds like it is a big deal um peppermint oil is really really despised by ants so what i would recommend before you do anything more dramatic and chemical based um, and like conventional toxic chemical based is just to try putting essential oil of peppermint um, all around their anthill. And um, I would like not be shy on the bottle front and just like drip it everywhere. <laughs> There's nothing bad that can happen to your garden and you will just deter the ants um, that much more. After that, I'm sure there are other options and please, oh my gosh, if anyone knows of them, let me know. Otherwise things like, um, you know, otherwise there's more chemical, um, toxic chemical things that are next steps. Um, this is a quick one. This person's heard that aphids are born pregnant. Is it true? Oh yes, absolutely brilliant adaptations and this is part of the fun thing of know your enemy love thy enemy i mean there's just you you will even though you want so badly to eradicate the aphid like you can't help but just be in awe of their genius of their absolute brilliance it's totally being a detective and just <laughs> and just I, you'll it'll blow your mind so yeah it's um and then you'll have a lot more compassion and awe for them which then will make it harder to kill them but not that hard and <laughs> it just keeps life interesting <laughs> um liz is wondering if you could talk just for a minute about lace wings oh yes Oh my gosh, I love lace wings so much. And it's so hard and I feel, yeah, there's so much more to share. And it's so hard to just focus on like, dun, 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 the pest insects and the diseases. It's so much more, I love talking about what we can do to you know, boost plant health. And let's talk about the awesomeness of ladybugs and the awesomeness of lace wings. So lace wings, we have an awesome blog about them too. Let me not be self so self-aggrandizing. We have a blog you might find fascinating on lace wings also. <laughs> and so lace wings are these lovely little, I mean, imagine a tiny little mayfly with a lovely little green body, like a centimeter long with these, I mean, they're called lace wings. Imagine how beautiful that insect is. And so these beautiful stained glass wings and they are ravenous and they only want to be eating your thrips, your aphids, and they are not generalists they are super specific and just going after your aphids and thrips so they're so ravenous they also they come out net, like absolutely going to eat anything in sight and so they generally tend to lay their eggs on plants that have lots of aphids or thrips on them 
in lieu of that, they actually lay their eggs on tiny little filaments, spindles, and lay the eggs at the very top. There's usually four or five right in a row. So they're really fun to find. And they lay them on those filaments because those little hungry lacewings, when they hatch, when the eggs hatch, they crawl, they would just eat each other if they found each other first. <laughs> so they literally time them so they don't hatch all at once and they're, they have to crawl down the filament and can't easily find their brothers and sisters. Even they would eat the egg if they found the egg. So yeah, they are laid right and they, those eggs are generally laid really close to where there's abundant aphids and they are just merciless. I think like the statistics that you've heard of how many mosquitoes bats eat in the night, that's how many <laughs> aphids a lacewing is going to eat in an hour. So they're just... Yeah, lace wings are so beautiful and they're totally, you know, endemic here in the Northeast. I'm not sure how wide the range is apart from the Northeast, but they are just absolutely like right up there with ladybugs, like top tier beneficial insect. Last question of the evening. Can I assume that watering in the morning is just as important when it comes to the flowers as it is for the vegetables? Oh yes, absolutely. So many flowers are so susceptible to powdery mildew. So yes, that is such, such a key. Um, yes, thank you. Flowers, vegetables, herbs, anything that you would like to prevent disease and pest insects on. <laughs> and so, yeah, and I just want to thank you all and acknowledge that, oh my gosh, we spent so much time just talking about the like bird's eye view of how to keep plants healthy. And there's so much more to share about the nuances of every single one of these diseases, every single one of these pests, and I'll spend the rest of my days learning more about them through joy and through great struggle. <laughs> and I'm just so grateful to be doing this work in community with you all. And most sincerely, I'm learning things constantly. I'm, I think things are true that then I turn it around and I'm like, oh, I, good thing I know this now differently. So I'm constantly learning more, changing my mind. And that's what evolution is all about. So please don't hesitate to reach out with awesome articles you find, terrifying insects, what the heck is this? Reach out, share those, any kind of diseases. And thank you also for, if you'd love to share those in the spirit of helping build our community um, ID library, it will be so amazing to have you there. And all of our common interests and observations will just uh, increase our common abundance um, for these years and hopefully generations to come. And I'd love to close with our that poem that we opened with. Um, and so this poem called Enough and Plenty by our dear friend Digger. Underground, the garlic seed is multiplying. Yesterday, we planted one. Tomorrow, there will be many. Abundance in the, is the dream this world is made from. Not too much for one of us, but plenty and enough for all of us. So thank you for growing your gardens, not just for you and not just for your lace wings, but for your great grandchildren and pardon me making myself cry and for everyone else in your community. We're all more hungry than we ever will know. So thank you for knowing the questions are the answers as well. And don't be shy, I wanna hear all your questions and celebrate all the things to celebrate and mourn all the things that we're mourning. And thank you, it's Thanks, such a good way. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Feel free to come Bye. off mute and say good night. It's so much fun. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, it's a pleasure. Thank so you. <laughs> so much. Oh, thank you, friends. Thank you, thank you Stacy. Thank you so 